after making a hit, especially something as big as La 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 was, it like poisoned your brain. There was a while where I was like, all oh, this is just garbage because I was just trying to reproduce that. Like, at that exact moment, I was like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Armenia is uh, going to come after me on this one for okay. sure. Mm, what are they? There's been several times where I'm just like sitting on a plane and I'm like, if this thing crashed right now, I'd be totally okay. We have to keep moving. We have to keep doing things. I don't know if I will ever be content. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. Baby No Money, a 28 year old rapper and meme lord who started as a homeschooled gamer. He now has a viral hit with over 1 billion plays, but despite Despite his success, he still lives with his parents and works himself to exhaustion. How does this submissive and breedable Canadian boy deal with the immense pressure of being a mega viral touring musician? I'm Anthony Padilla, and I spent a day with Baby No Money to find out. Hello, Baby Hello. No Money? Alex? Yeah. Baby No Money? Baby No Money. Baby No Money. Anthony. Yes, I can't believe we showed up today both wearing the same outfit. This is so, it's kind of embarrassing. I'm, I, it's a little bit weird that we both wore the same thing today. I mean, hey. People do say sometimes I am submissive. You must you be breedable. I'm breedable. You're submissive? Yeah. Oh yeah. I think together we make a little a little duo. A little match made in heaven. Yeah. Uh yeah, it was just it was just weird. It just felt right to wear this today and you as well. You just like straight out of your hotel room today, you were like, this feels right. Yeah. I just looked it up. You have over two billion plays on your songs. La 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 contributes for like a billion of them. Yeah, La La is a big one. La La is a ginormous song, to be completely honest. That's crazy. Did you know the moment that you made that, that, that like, were you like, that's gonna be crazy huge? Weirdly, I was very emotionally convinced uh, that it was going to be a big song. I think uh, a lot of the time when you, like, tell yourself a song's gonna be big or you believe in it, it, it comes across a little bit more natural. I mean, I remember Ari and I, we, that's Y2K, he, yeah. We were driving in his car and he was like, should we keep the intro part in? And I was like, I don't know. We are like, how's, this, how's it go again? And it's nah, like, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, exactly, pretty much. Yeah. So we ended up leaving it in, but uh, I was like, how many streams do you think this is gonna do first year? And he's like, 35 million. And it did like 30 million in the first 12 days. And at that time I was like, oh wow, this is a, this is big. But you, I mean, there have been other songs that you've made where you thought they were gonna be bigger than they were. All the time. As well, right? All the time. So it's not just about having the confidence that it's gonna be big. Oh, it was completely out of my capability. Yeah. Like, completely out of my capability. God damn, a, a billion plays though. It's funny, I brought up to my mom that I was making, because obviously we made the Submissive and Breedable song together. Yeah. And I brought up to my mom and she was like, oh, I know Baby No Money. <laughs> and she knew you from that, from, from La La La. That's crazy. Yeah, oh man, it was kind of crazy the way that we even started working together. Ian and I saw that you were on Hassan's live stream uh, with Young Gravy and somehow Smosh was mentioned and you made it clear that you had watched us growing up. And Ian and I were literally in the middle of, of brainstorming <laughs> our first music video that we, because we haven't made any legit music videos in like years. 10 years. Yeah. So this was our first music video that we we're going to make. And we were like, we, it'd be so sick to work with uh, a musician who, who could like elevate this to the next level. So then we both followed you on Twitter. And then within 30 seconds, you, you DM both of us. <laughs> and you were like, you were like, what the f why did Smosh just follow me? What what's going on? And and uh, I was like, yo, we're thinking about making a song uh, called Submissive and Breedable. And you were just like, I'm in. That was it. I, I remember specifically I was recording. Yeah, you were in the middle, you were at a studio as well. I was, right? I, was I was recording at the same time and I like I like stopped my take and I recorded. I'm like, bro, what the f Smosh just followed me. I'm like, why why do they follow me? And I was like, I'm, hold on, I'm just gonna message them. And I messaged them immediately. Now here we are, both submissive and really Breedable. Really breedable now. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that after that music video comes out, which now it's already out, your DMs just flooded. <laughs> flooded. The entire video, you're either wearing this or the tiniest <laughs> leather shorts with your nipples out. The entire they, they time. They could have been a little tinier. You, I know, you were asking for tinier, <laughs> but that was the tiniest we could get. That was it the tiniest was, we could get. It was pretty tiny, yeah. But you filled them out yeah. very nicely. I did fill them out a little bit. And I'm sure that's you're gonna be getting many comments like that. Plus, you're, you know, your feet are out. Yeah, very exposed. Free dogs. Yeah. Just going back to your to your roots, you you have this really interesting story. You started off as a little bit more of a gamer, mm. an internet nerd, yeah, boy, nerd boy, nerd boy, and nerd boy, and you ventured into music, and then that has caught on, two billion plays at this point. You you were just like, what? How did that transition happen? You were you were, you were kind of telling me about it. I, I used to write poetry, like 
a while ago. It was uh, just like just for fun. Eh, yeah, I mean, I so I broke my back in grade twelve, and that was like kind of like the 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 pivotal moment in my in my in my life when I was like I was an athlete. I used to be a competitive swimmer, and then I had to pretty much give any goal of at physical ability kind of excellence or endurance plays yada 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 as soon as that went out the door i was like okay now i'm depressed you know I, I broke my hand at the exact same time so i had a ton of muscle atrophy muscle atrophy for you guys is uh when you lose muscle because you haven't used it people don't know what that means i mean atrophy is like not that bro you gotta get on your atrophy game yeah i i say that word atrophy at least six times a day so. really yeah i think most people do okay wow yeah i was super depressed you know, I had nothing going for me, literally nothing. You know, I'm not the most academically savvy individual. Um, but at that point, I was like, okay, how can I use this um, for my benefit? Um, originally, I was just going to go to school for kinesiology, which is what I ended up doing. Mm. Um, so while I was going through my education, I just found myself kind of like, you know, there was the lack of passion, you know, uh, when you're doing anything, you want to love it. Mm -hmm. What you're doing, you love. Sure, yeah. What I do, I love now. I was like, dang, I don't really have passion for the kinesiology world and, and like becoming a chiropractor or physiotherapy. But the one thing I did know is like, I know how to emotionally deal with the physical pain. So I was like, okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do with that is I'm just gonna be able to give back to people. Cause I was like, I just wanna help people because I know when breaking your back, like rather than it being actually physically painful and you know, debilitating, what it does is it emotionally just scars you. Yeah. So having chronic pain on a constant basis is just like very exhaustive. So I understood that and having the ability to understand that it gives you the ability to be empathetic when you're working with clients. So that was like my first basis. So I was like, okay, cool, go to school. But then one, one uh, sunny day, actually it wasn't that sunny, in Vancouver, I was chilling with my friends and we're like, hey, let's go to my friend Seb's house. Smoked a ginormous blunt and laughed over a Chief Keef type beat. And I was like, at that exact moment, I was like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. What, what did you, did you freestyle over it? What did you do? Yeah, sure. But it yeah. was like, it was like, -ha 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 -ha. like uh, literally just saying nothingness. Yeah. But when I heard it back, I was like, whoa, I just made art. Whether or not it was good, mm. doesn't matter. But in that moment, I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Something something like really just switched in my brain where whether or not it was because it was faded, but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was very interesting because I've, I've been like, oh, I haven't felt this level of happiness in years. And I was mm. like, I'm just gonna keep doing it because it was just like injecting happiness into my body. Like it was, I was like, oh, give me, give me. Right. I just kept on making music because it, it was just so fun. And now I'm pretty much here. Yeah, and clearly it's not just about making the music. You know, you, you could have, that could have been your passion. You could have made a million songs and they would have just been a, a side hobby, but this is your full-time thing. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because all the things in your life that led to you doing music, in a sense, were almost setting you up to be able to be successful doing the music because now you, you really have your finger on the pulse of like, what can push your music to be heard by more people. Like even, even throwing the thing at the top of La La La, you were like, no, let's keep it, right? You were telling me like, those are the moments, those are the magical moments, or the, the ones that you weren't even planning for. And I think that that intro probably, I mean, the song is good without it, but I think that probably contributed to a huge amount of success. Completely. That yeah. is the reason why that song blew up. Right. Which is crazy, because if you take the song out of that, if you just remove it, you listen to the song, it's still great, but there's no, it's kind of like a cherry sundae, but with no cherry. Right. It just doesn't make sense. Like after making a hit, especially something as big as La 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 was, after making that, you you it like poisoned your brain. You were saying like you felt this high for six days. The, the poisoning concept came more from like my expectation of myself or the expectation of others to reproduce a song similar. But it was interesting because I had two and a half, maybe almost three-ish, albums out at that point mm. and if you went through my back catalog you could easily tell that that was a song that did, did not make sense with my catalog mm. that was the first time i ever sat down and was like all right let's make a pop song like literally the first time i ever did was it, it all rap hip-hop before that it was all rap so that was like kind of where my whole my whole music catalog was at and then i released this super left field like me singing auto-tune yada 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 and 
people probably had the expectation of that. So that started dwelling on 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 me. And I was like, ah, oh, man, like I got to work harder to make something similar to, to make it catchier. And there was a while where I was like making making music. I was like, oh, this is just garbage because I was just trying to reproduce that. Even even when re we reached out to you, I feel like a lot of musicians would be like, why do I want to make a, a track with, you know, these Internet guys? But because you grew up so ingrained in Internet culture, I feel like it was it was a no brainer for you because you saw what like you know what the internet is capable yeah. of doing and a lot of your music does lean into that like silly meme territory totally. but it feels like you started to to graduate from that like that's how you got your footing and that's how you got a lot of listeners and then you've started to kind of graduate to taking the music a little bit more seriously. Was that a calculated approach of like, oh, it's gotta be like meme heavy to like get the footing or like, can I not like, I don't wanna take it too seriously too soon or? Personally, right now, I feel like I'm more into the meme world now. I don't know, I mean, memes are great. Dude. <laughs> Life, the thing is, is I had a long a long conversation about corniness with Y2K ages ago and he's, he's like, everything is inherently corny. Or cringe. As or cringe, say, right? yeah, or cringe. It's, it's Depends synonymous. on how you look at it. It's your perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, well, taking anything seriously could be considered completely. Or it's completely, yeah. Like taking any taking yourself too seriously is just cringe in itself. But at the same time, people would be like, "Yo, that's cringe that you're not taking yourself too serious." Because mm. like some rappers, some musicians take themselves so serious, but it's like that's their like guide point of what what is corny, what is cringe, because they don't want them to assume that that is corny. Or like the, their fan base to assume that, that that is corny, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just like all perceived value kind of like uh, facade. Mm -hmm. In the end of the day, I'm just trying to have fun. Over the past little while, you know, I've been able to just like kind of encapsulate just making music, just like making whatever and mm -hmm. making sure I make whatever. I know for a fact because of my taste, I know whatever I make, it's going to be decent. So I'll just keep doing that. And it seems like pretty much after every hundred songs I make, I make a, a ginormous big song. You told me that you were making your next album and that you wanted to have 100 songs completed as kind of, I guess like demos for, for possible tracks. Yeah. And then you would select from those, mm -hmm. take those and, and find your favorite ones to refine and put together on the album. Yeah. Is your philosophy just like churn out a bunch of stuff just to see what hits? Yeah, because making a good song doesn't take time. Typically, if you make a good song, it's milliseconds. I think people would assume that the more time you spend working on a song, the better it is or the more chance it has to be good. It's kind of like the more typically the more I spend on a song, the worse it gets. Really? Is, is it? Well, it's like, is there a threshold where it's like, Obviously, you need to spend some time on it. <laughs> well, okay, well, yeah, yeah, there's a special. So, like, I mean, like, I would say on average, like, baseline average, a full song will take, like, three hours. Sometimes it takes, like, 15 minutes. No joke. Really? Some, yeah, like, sometimes... Do you have any songs that popped off that took 15 minutes? La La La's Hook took 15 minutes. So, like, the, the part that blew up, that was, yeah. like, literally 15 minutes. You had no baseline for that? So, he was just... I was like, yeah, just play something on the guitar. He, like, put the... the Omnisphere patch on and then like started playing the guitar and I was like when I pop up immediately really you just knew that that was the beat you pretty much I just yeah. like it was it was very 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 fast and he was like oh man that's fire and then I wrote that really quick and then I went into the booth and I was like oh damn do I really just forget the melody and I was like <laughs> and then I was like let's just repeat a word and then we just said asha ma raise it go like sha 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 uh -huh. that was it mm -hmm. there's so many small little variables that play into the fact of like how that song was made and like for me, a thing that I dislike the most is when I'm finishing songs, if I need to re-record things, it's a nightmare because like embodying that exact take or that exact like scratch take sometimes is impossible and you could be sitting there for like an hour just to do Just trying to word. get the same yeah, sound. Yeah. It was really interesting working with you on this song because when we, you know, going into the studio, I feel like there's a little bit of this pressure to have it all figured out. So you just go there and you could just like complete the song quickly, knowing that you're gonna get it. Cause we only had the one day, but you know, you were like, no, let's not, let's not think too hard about it. Let's, yeah. let's get in there. You know, let's, uh, let's kind of craft it there on the spot and you know, just, just 
play around, see what works and, and work with that. And there's a little bit of uneasiness going into that situation feeling like, but what if we don't get it? What if there's not enough time? We only have six hours. And we get in there and Ian and I have a lot of things, a lot of ideas on the paper, but nothing really like concrete. And we get in there and the way that you work is like so fast. You're like, I don't know this. And like, you started just like writing out a bunch of words and then that you're like, I don't know this rhyme, this rhyme. And it, it's just kind of like, it felt like it all fell together in the moment in a way that it couldn't have if we really like all pre-planned for too long before going in there. Yeah, usually it's just more fun to riff because nine times out of 10, if, if you're with like four boys, like Sloppenheimer is the craziest <laughs> bars. Dude. You threw, like, we were trying to figure out a, a, a line for that and you threw out the word Sloppenheimer. I was like, that needs to be in here. <laughs> and then we reverse engineered the, the line beforehand. She treat me like a doggy, call me her Weimaraner. I'd never even heard of that breed of dog. Me but, neither. But, but like, Ari was like, oh, Weimaraner. And I think that we said it wrong because we had to we had to make it rhyme with Sloppenheimer. But yeah, it, it felt like that that writing session was about like finding the little magic in those certain words and, and moments. And we were like, let's work off of that. Like even, even Ian saying, uh, until I'm ready. And yeah. then we were like, that sounds like a SpongeBob thing. And then it was like sponging on my bob. Yeah. Until I'm ready. You know, like there were all those little magic moments where I don't think that we could have came to the, to those moments if we had, like taking the time to like craft it out for hours and hours before getting into the studio. Well, yeah, it's just like a uh, keep it simple, stupid. You know, yeah. it's like the KISS principle, especially with music is if it feels good, it's better than if it doesn't. Especially when it is all about the feeling. Yeah, know, it's all moments. about the feeling. Cause it's like cliche to be completely right. it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it's very cliche. It's like, you know when Kendrick Lamar said, bitch don't kill my vibe? Yeah. It's like really that. If, if you're <laughs> listening to a song, it's three minutes, and at 2.23, there's something that just doesn't sound good to anyone objectively, the, the vibe's off. And that's all that making a song is. It doesn't matter. You just have to encapsulate that vibe and have people like export or transport, be transported to that world of what you just created kind of mm -hmm. vibe. So mm -hmm. um, it's all about the vibes. It's all about the vibes, man. <laughs> so we yeah. spent, you know, those, those four to six hours or whatever recording writing and then producing and recording it all in that same session. And we all had a few weeks of just sitting with the song. You reached out and it was a feeling that I had kind of been feeling as well, but I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know if we have time to adjust this. And you, you reached time. out and you're like, this is a little long, this kind of drags. And I was like, yeah. There was all this like build up instrumental at the beginning and at the end it like tapered off. And it was, yeah, it was like a four minute song. Yeah. And it, was way too it, ju long. it just felt, there was something about it where once I listened to it once, I was like, got it, I'm done. But you were like, this doesn't feel loopable, replayable. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. The vibe wasn't there. Now we, was not we, we implemented the vibe with the new beat. Yeah, so we went back into the recording studio with Ari and uh, I mean, I feel like we completely, the song almost has a com completely different feel to it. Yeah. I mean, we'll play a little bit, I'll play a little bit of the demo, the first version of it right here. I love when she take control. She beat my meat, whack a mo. Uh, arch my back, curl my toe. Submissive and breathable. Bro, that shit was crazy, man. <laughs> it's so different. I remember listening so to it and I was like, man, this is a fever dream. It's so it's different. A fever dream. And but then, yeah, the new one is so good. And then we'll play a bit of the new one. I love when she take control. She beat my meat whack a mole. I arch my back, curl my toes. Submissive and breathe. Come big it sounds like a completely different song. Completely different song. I feel like I really relate to you in the way that you're like, ah, it just doesn't feel right. And you'll you'll know when it feels right. Yeah. And you'll throw out like a hundred ideas, and then you're like, I don't care if one or two of them are good, we roll with the one or two. I'm not gonna get my feelings hurt that, yeah. that the other 98 were not, you know, weren't it. Mm -hmm. and it's, it seems like that's the same approach that you're doing too with this next album. You have you had a goal to create 100 tracks before narrowing it down. What are you at right now? I think I'm at like 80-ish. That's crazy. But, but Thinking about making 80 songs, that's more tracks than many people can imagine ever making in their lifetime. I mean, yeah, I guess you're not wrong. I, it's just interesting because it's like it doesn't feel like I'm, like I'm working, you know. Um, you know, it's like just going to a studio and literally saying pee pee poo poo with my friends is mm -hmm. like it's really fun, and that's kind of like the basis of how I make music. Like you saw pretty much with Ari, it's like all right, what else could we do here? It's like a puzzle. Yeah, Although it, feels I, like, it feels like you're playing a fun game. Yeah, I hate puzzles. Trust me, 
but like I love making music. Do you feel like your childhood and your upbringing contributed to your your work ethic and approach to life? <laughs> My mom's Swiss. Uh-huh. Uh, so I'm never late. Uh -huh. and yeah, yeah. the first day that we met up with you, we told you an exact time that we'd be able to make it there, and you were just standing there. When we arrived, you were just standing there outside, and we're like, what the f how long have you been here? Like, uh, 15 minutes. I'm never late to anything. Anything. That is never, I've I've worked with musicians before, never encountered that before. Yeah, I, I hate being late. It's something yeah. that I just grew up with. I don't know, my mom was like, if you're late, you're an idiot. So I was like, all right, like, I'm just never gonna be late. Uh, well, my first couple jobs, I was working at like restaurants and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like the basis is like, if you're on time, you do a good job, you're just gonna get promoted. That's so true. Why wouldn't you just do that? It's so easy to do both of those. Cause it's like, one, you're already there for eight hours. You might as well just work hard for eight hours mm -hmm. or, or slack off and never get promoted. And then just, yeah. And then two, it's just like show up. Cause you're gonna have to be there anyway. Might as well just be there like on time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know. It's always just been engraved in my head that that, that is like the easiest, simplest thing to do. I mean, you said 115 today. Obviously, you're like 112. I it's know. Like, perfect. Shit. And then my dad, my dad just runs a really clean business. Uh, he, he owns a pots and pans, like houseware store. Mm -hmm. He runs very tight ship. I guess a very business forward, um, accounting forward. So I've always had like a little bit of a mindset, like a mathematical mindset where it's just like, I do this. What do I get from it? I do this. What do I get from it? He gave me a lot of tools to work on a business that he didn't even know about, but he's shown me a lot of tips and tricks and throughout, through, you know, throughout my business growing, it was very, very nice to just be able to be like, oh, I don't really know what's going on financially right now, dad. Like, are you able to help me and like teach me a little bit of the accounting world and like, and what's going on? Like I have money coming in. I don't know what to do with it. You were saying that you think that part of your work ethic comes from the fact that you have, are you both your parents immigrants or just your father? My dad's Armenian uh -huh. and yeah, mom's Swiss, Swiss Danish. I believe today we're gonna be trying some Armenian food. Mm. I don't think I've ever had Armenian food. Really? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. I mean, I mean we're in LA, today. dude, like. I know, I know, I don't know, I just don't hang out in the right parts, I guess, yeah, but I guess today's, so. today we're changing that. Wow, I'm so down. Let's bring out the Armenian food, let's do some I know tests. some of the names, I know some of the names of the Armenian foods. Yeah, I think we might be blindfolded. Really? I think we're blindfolded taste testing. It's Even more be... submissive. Yeah, double naughty up. So y'all are used double to wearing naughty. blindfolds, huh? Yeah. Yeah. See? It's, See how long that's like okay? That. I'm ready. I've been there. All right, y'all. So I'm going to be feeding y'all five different foods. Yummy. So you're going to try and guess it. If you get one right, we're going to stack a beanie on your head. Okay. Armenia is uh, going to come after me on this one for okay. sure. Okay. Are we ready for the first food? I'm going to feed uh, it. Oh my mouth, though, huh? What are you feeding? A spoon? Is this I, a spoon? I've got tongs. I'm not touching. You're gonna any tong of... into my mouth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. I'm scared. It. There's something Dude, so didn't... scary about putting something in your Maybe mouth. Maybe we're that you doing can't you see. first. Open wide. <laughs> Hearing that shit. I eat these all the time. This is really good. Oh, this is good. So. What the it's something deep fried. Mouth. No, it's not deep fried. It's, it's phyllo pastry, or it's like pastry wrapped in with like meat, but it's not meat. It's like the little dumplings, essentially. Do you uh, want to guess? What the name is or we what? We don't know. Guess yeah, what? the name. You guess first. I, I don't know. I, I, I know what it is. I, I, I've eaten them all the time. I would always be like, yo, grandma, can I have these? Can I have the little dumplings? Uh, <laughs> I'm letting my grandma down so bad right now, for sure. I have no idea what kind of words or how this would even sound, but I'm guessing it's arshdig. Okay, that is incorrect. Dang it! <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know okay. the name. It is mante. Oh, fuck. mante. Yeah, it I'm, is mante. I'm gonna give uh, you a half a point, Phoebe, for for knowing that it's little dumplings. A little yeah. dumpling? Yeah, they I... are basically little dumplings. So, are y'all ready for the next one? Sure. It's gonna be a little bite, bite down. Uh, okay. Bite down. What? Bite down. What the fuck? Bite down. I know this too. I just don't know the name. What the f I've had these before. There's a lot of oil on my lips right now. It's like a potato Whoa. dumpling. <laughs> Again. Whoa. With like. Whoa. There's some weird shit with this one. Typically, I feel like this. These ones are like little balls of X Y Z. It feels like there's like some kind of beans that have been smashed into paste in this. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. I don't know. That's I'm gonna lock in my final answer with ball with potato and typically ground beef. I'm gonna say deep fried ball of beans. 
It was baki kofte. Oh. Oh, yeah, you knew that one, right? So kofte is typically just means like a ball of or something of, I'm pretty sure. Kofte, they're all, mm -hmm. it's just like meat, I think. I don't know. I feel like my Armenian fans, if they see this, they're going to be pissed off at me, so. I'll yeah. give you another half a point for that. What? Damn, what? I'm, I'm getting the two. You just don't get a half a point for that. I'm getting hella tuked up. All right, next one, y'all. Here we go. This one is- Just give me the one that I know. I Please. hope you know this one. The scariest part was not just receiving something in my mouth, but having to chomp down on something that is on my mouth. Oh, I feel them. Ah. Uh, I know, I, I'm sorry, King. Let me, give me a second. I'm 99% sure I know the name. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> oh, what was that shit? It's oh, good, right, isn't it? What do you think? Oh, this sounds like a cinnamon roll. It's a churro. It's a churro. <laughs> kind of tastes like a churro when a cinnamon roll had a. It's like churro with saffron. Oh shit, that's good. I'm pretty sure it's just a baklava. Yeah. Yeah, baklava. Ding, ding, ding. That's the food I thought was Greek. That's not Greek. It might be Greek, or I don't know where the the origination of where baklava came from, but I feel like a lot of uh, the countries out there kind of like adapted oh. this sweet because it's just fucking amazing. That's good. Yeah. No, no, it's delicious. I got on the next one. Mm. What the? Why is there dill in that? So good. What's I mean, it just it? tastes like a just tastes like a dill infused spanakopita, but it's it's not. There's a different name to it. It feels like a puff pastry filled with dill sauce. Yeah, and spinach. And spinach. That's my final answer. Lock it in. What's it called? It's a uh, Zen God of Hats. Uh, I was not gonna get that one at all. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but Zen God of Hats. I, 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 I don't speak Z. that well. All right, we've got a little spoon coming into your mouth. <laughs> For your final words before death. Man, y'all just playing a game with me, aren't you? Oh, it was cold. This is edamame. This is edamame! <laughs> <laughs> this that is, is edamame. That's correct, that's correct. <laughs> Sweet. All right, there you go, Anthony. Oh, what is this? This is your first win. Doesn't it feel good? My first win? Yeah, you I... got it right. Oh, you've been getting on beanies this whole time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know. I'm stacking over here. <laughs> Y'all can unmask them if you want to see what the foods look like. Interesting. So this is the first one. <laughs> one. What's so funny? You got four beanies on, bro. Oh yeah, I'm looking crazy. So you were almost Lil No Money. Yeah. Lil No Money. <laughs> that was almost you. Uh, yeah, it was. So when I. <laughs> but there's all these Lils. There's a lot of Lils. There's a lot of Lils out there. Yeah, a lot of Lils. Were you like, I'm not. I, there's too many Lils. What's smaller than Lil? Baby. A BB? Yeah. A Not baby. even a baby, a BB. And that was that was it though. I was just like, what's smaller than this? Because every every single person was doing low. So did you feel like, oh, I wanna I want to be the smallest and then also have no money? Like what 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 what? I guess it was like my first take of it was kind of like just an oxymoron. Yeah. Cause I'm not a baby and And you it, are rich. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it was it was kind of just like everyone's rapping about money. A, a lot of the time, I was just like, let's rap about trying to make money. Yeah, you were saying that you had a weird relationship with money. Yeah, I mean that's that's just like something that my dad kind of instilled in me. So how my dad kind of perceives money is like, you make money, you have a family, you support them, uh, put a family over your head, or put a house over your head, <laughs> put a family over You're your really head. You're really strong. Yeah, and you know just make make means to live. I don't really know how, like the intricacies of how it may be a positive trauma or a negative trauma and how it's affected me, but I've definitely noticed that there are some things I'm like, you know, I'm kind of reserved on when I'm like, oh, should I pay for that? Or should that be, why would I want that? Do I right. need that? No, I would just want that. Yeah, I feel like I have a weird relationship with money in the sense that I grew up without much of it. And for a long time, you know, when I when I started making some money, when I first started finding some success on YouTube, I was just saving all of it because I was really I was scared. I was like, I gotta hoard this. But now I'm I'm starting to be like, wait, I I was actually perfectly happy though, in a weird way. Like obviously there's a threshold where you have to have a certain amount of money to feel safe yeah. and secure. But once you're past that threshold, everything is kind of extra. So in a weird sense, I feel like in some ways, I'm a little bit more flippant with it, cause I'm like, eh, if I if I don't have it in the future, I I, I have been okay in the past, and I would be okay now. Yeah, yeah, in a weird sense. But that brings us to our next segment, 
called Does Baby Really Have No Money? <laughs> Here's a list of my financials. Uh, my accountant here. Yeah, so we're so we uh, we hacked into your bank account, oh, wow. and we're gonna take a look at how much funds you actually have. So we have to guess how much money is in here, in here, or how many coins are in here. How much money? Oh, so like adding up, like the quarter is twenty five cents. Is it, obviously, it's, oh, there's quarters and there's dimes. quarters. There's pennies. Okay. Is there an answer? There's some shit no. to throw. <laughs> Uh, there's weird random shit. This feels like it was just a junk drawer thrown into a, yeah. a jar. Uh, yeah, you wanna take a look? You wanna feel how that feels? Let's say, um, $18. All right, guess? 17. So, oh, oh, what the f It was three twenty nine and 10 <laughs> <laughs> Ether, man, come on. You got played. <laughs> Well, this is <laughs> well, uh, Next I'm is that out. stack of bands. This? Stack of bands. So we're guessing how much, we're guessing how many bills are in here. There's six of these packs in here. Is you wanna number? get a quick look? I'm trying to guess how many are in each six. Oh, you're counting? No, 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 I'm not gonna get. You're gonna, you're gonna guess first this time. $12,000. That's exactly what my guess was. Bro, what? We're submissive and I was like, there's six of these in here. I think there's probably two thousand dollars in each of these. Uh, I'm gonna change it to sixteen thousand though. All right, what is it? There are sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> you were so. In there. Well. Technically, there is one real dollar bill, so actually, it's worth one real money. Oh, one could... real money. Oh, I found the real dollar. Yeah. Dang. Damn, yeah, I always make this mistake. What? When I'm counting up $60,000, I never count right, you know? Just like. That's always, it always happens. Always, it's like every day, it's, it's like an everyday offense, you know? Uh, wait, what do we do with this? Shoot it. All right. I think it never works. Oh, that shit's empty. Uh, I'm gonna guess $2,200. Don't look at that! $2,300. You. <laughs> it was forty three hundred. What the? F Bro, you can't just guess a hundred dollars over me. Second, I'm gonna ask y'all some grocery store items. Oh, uh, okay. This first batch is from Ralph's. One loaf of Nature's Own Honey Wheat Sandwich Bread. How much is it? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, American prices. Four ninety nine. <laughs> I was gonna guess 497. 497 nine, oh no, 498. <laughs> I was gonna guess 492. I'm gonna stick with 492. 92. I don't know why. It's 97, 98, or 99. It's 359. Man, inflation not working on my favor. Minute gluten free white rice, 14 ounces. 14 ounces? You don't know ounces, huh? You use milliliters? Yeah. I can give you the conversion if you want it. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Please, I need that. Yeah. I'm, I'm using a conversion. 396 grams. Grams? Use milliliters. No, no, that'll. That's you know fine. grams too? Yeah, I know grams. <clears throat> Freak. Gluten free? Mm hmm. Rice is always Isn't gluten free. It's not enough. Wow, box. they're really just trying to run up the price for nothing. <laughs> that's crazy. Is it vegan? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dairy free? Dairy free? I'm going to say like $4.99. Mm. $6.69. I'm gonna say uh, 399. 250. Okay, nice. Give me that bean. I was just thinking about this earlier today. I was like, damn, you know what? I miss the one thing about touring is like you don't have the ability to just go buy groceries and eat them and like oh, make true. a dinner. It's like not very often. So this is this is why I'm taking an L here for sure. I don't go into grocery stores very often. Oatly original oat milk. Ooh. How big? Uh, like the regular. What's the regular? I think it's like, like a, one liter, two liter. I think it's one. It, it's I think it's like a one, right? Carton, yeah. carton. I think it's a That's one. a six ninety nine. I'm gonna guess four ninety nine. Ah. It is three ninety nine. What? Where are we shopping? Ralph's. Ralph's. We're gonna switch to a Canadian grocery store. I All found. Right. Oh. Here, we, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Easy, easy. This okay. is Save on Foods. Do you know it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I go there often. Okay. We'll guess in Canadian dollars. Avalon Organic Medium Brown Eggs, one dozen. Okay, these are expensive for sure. That's like seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine, four ninety nine, nine sixty nine. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, bro, eggs are dummy expensive in Canada, man. Really? Why? I don't know. Chickens Every don't. They're not laying them up there. <sighs> no. They're not horny up there. <laughs> no. One bunch of cilantro. One ninety nine. Uh, two ninety nine. One oh six. Woo! Cleared. 
Man, my stack is getting <laughs> crazy. Your stack is like perfect. I have no idea oh, what's going on. It's a perfect on. code. Samyang spicy instant ramen, five count. Eight ninety nine. I was gonna guess. I'll guess seven ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. <laughs> Let's go. Costco organic bananas, three pounds. Oh, I buy. I three used to buy these all the time. I'll let you go first. Is this in U.S. dollars? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, think about a banana. Bananas are actually kind of heavy. They're pretty dense. And this it's, is how many? Three pounds. It's like a bunch. Mm -hmm. It's one bunch. Bananas are not a pound each, though, are they? Yeah, but you get six in a bunch. Yeah, like six in a bunch, probably. What a funny ass conversation. Ten ninety nine. Three ninety nine. Two ninety nine. What the. F why do I think it's so much? How much is that? No, Six bunches? What's going on in this one? It's, got, it's a like, music hat. It's got headphones on it. Oh, epic. That is very epic. No, so the bunch is six. It's not six bunches. One bunch. I thought she just had three pounds. Yeah. Dude, oh, a, bana pounds. a banana is like half a pound. Oh. That's perfect math. Okay. All right. Baby, right? baby really do got money. Well, I got bananas, bro. Baby, baby really you got, got banana. My, I got my, I got, I keep my thing on me. I got the banana on me. Are you frustrated because you don't have the perfect wardrobe to match your ever evolving lifestyle? Whether you're getting ready for vacation or you're simply bored of your old choices, Stitch Fix makes sure that you always have something to wear. Stitch Fix is the best way to shop new styles and brands. Think of them as your style partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks that you love without breaking the bank. You simply share your preferences, style, and budget, and Stitch Fix sends you five items in a fix right to your door. They have over a thousand thousand brands and styles, so no matter what season you're in, Stitch Fix has you covered. And with the wide range of sizes, they'll find the perfect fit. Plus, you get to try everything on at home, keep what you like, and send back the rest. Over time, Stitch Fix and their stylists will match you with greater precision based on your likes and dislikes. So if you want style that makes you feel as good as you look, get started today at stitchfix.com slash Padilla. That's stitchfix.com slash Padilla. Stitchfix.com slash Padilla. And this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever feel like your brain is getting in its own way? Like you know what you should do or what's good for you, but you just can't seem to do it? Therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back so you can work for yourself instead of against yourself. As I'm sure many of you know, I've been a huge advocate of therapy since I started going about six years ago. It's helped me in almost every facet of my life. Whether dealing with anxiety or depression or just the day-to-day -day struggles of being human, therapy has been a guiding light for me. So if you've been thinking about therapy, BetterHelp might be perfect for you. It's entirely online and it's designed to work around your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll be matched with a certified and licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional cost. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Give BetterHelp a try. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Padilla. Now, back to the world of baby no money. What do you think happens after we die? <laughs> I mean, so I did like a hero's dose of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I would say what's a hero's dose? A lot. Shrez, we did a lot. What, was um, everything melting? Like, everything what? was being put together. Wait, tell me about this trip. So I was l sitting in this black room, pretty much crying, just like thinking about everything, and just like sitting in this room, just melding my thoughts and scraping hell. You know, do I think I came out of it with like cleaner thoughts and an energy? Perhaps, I don't, you know, I, I have no idea. But it was interesting because I've never thought about the world in such a, I guess, a yin and yang perspective for a little while. I, I like fully understood that we just decompose. If you think of it this way, you probably live forever because when, you know, it depends on how you are, um, if you're cremated or, or you're buried or whatnot, it's like, you're just gonna decompose. Like, let's say a maggot eats me. I am a part of that maggot that will go potentially become a butterfly. Sure, yeah, a part of you will go on forever. That doesn't mean that you are living forever though. And the, and your consciousness is also not necessarily transferred. By the end of nearing my death, I am, I am certain we're gonna be able to like download our own files of our brain, just share it, save it, put it on Dropbox and make Dropbox robots and just become a robot. So our brain will just be in the cloud. Yeah. And then we'll continue, our consciousness will exist forever with or without a physical form. Maybe. Do Probably you want to live forever? I don't think I'd want to do that. When I was on another planet off the mushrooms, I was like, you know, if I were to die right now, it's, it's all good. Yeah, I did shrooms this past weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, even with the smaller dosage, I felt, and I, I've, I've been dealing with a lot of stress and, and just oh, these overwhelmed feelings for, for many months. And 
this past weekend was the first time I was like, it's okay. Yeah, there was a sense of peace yeah. that I hadn't felt in a long time. And I still feel it a little bit, even though it's been days and days now. I feel like a big part of what makes going through certain struggles so difficult is the fact that your mind is like, this is not okay, this is not okay, this is not okay. But you do something like shrooms and the chemicals, interact with your brain in a way that makes you feel like, maybe it's okay. A lot of the time I would just like shy away from conflict and shy away from things I don't like, rather than just like experience them, like feeling them, and then like understanding that that, that is what I don't like, but rather than just not touching it, and like never experiencing it, you know, it gives you the ability to be like, oh, like I am messing up or I am doing something wrong and I deserve these consequences rather than just being like, I don't, I, I didn't do anything wrong, blah, 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 blah. So in turn, it's just like, it's kind of made me at peace where it's like, I've done so much in my life already, truthfully. Like I, I'm so unbelievably blessed to be able to be in the position I'm in. And it's, it's, it's it really is, it's amazing. Like I've, I don't know how many beanies on my head talking to you, doing a podcast in LA, just ate great Armenian food. Eight and like beanies, eight, eight beanies. beanies. So I'm I'm eight beanied up right now. And this is my life. So there's been several times where I'm just like sitting on a plane and I'm like, if this thing crashed right now, I'd be totally okay. Cause you know, I've I've taken hundreds of flights. I've seen hundreds of faces. I've seen most of the countries, you know, it's like, I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful that that has happened for me. I remember there'd be a lot of times where I'd go to my grandmother's and she'd be like, I'm afraid of dying. And I'm like, you are 98 years old, grandma. Like you have lived the f-ing life. But I would sit there and I would have a conversation about it mm-hmm. and like, yeah, I mean, I don't want to die, obviously, but it would be okay. You know, and, and, and I think that that's something that I remember talking to my dad. I was like, dad, we should we should see if she's into just doing a hero's dose of mushrooms, like genuinely, like, because there was two years, three years, four years of her just being so unhappy. And life is too short. Um, and uh, it's a, being able to do hallucinogens and uh, mushrooms and, and LSD and stuff like that has just given me the ability to appreciate just the finer things in life. You get very caught up in all of this. And a lot of times when I go home with my parents and I'm like, this is what life is, is family and friends and and love. It's just something that I've like slowly, slowly been gathering over time. And uh, it's amazing, you know, like when you figure that out, right? So. Mm-hmm. Did your grandma ever do the mushrooms? I f- wish, man. <laughs> but she was a beauty. She was a beauty. She was a funny lady. What did all of that teach you about death? You know, like you you said that you felt okay, but did they give you a sense of peace? I wouldn't say it's a sense of peace, but I just know that deep down, I feel like I have done something. Mm. And was that a fear of yours that you wouldn't do something? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I remember when I was like playing WoW in grade, like grade twelve, and I was like applying to universities and stuff. And I got into a couple universities. I was like, I'm like, shit, man. I'm so bad at typical academia. I'm just so bad. Like, I don't know how to do this. I'm like so bad at writing. And, you know, I was like, I was watching my brother become an incredible photographer. You know, he knows how to make music. He's really talented at making music. My sister doing her PhD, like absolute genius child. And I'm like, I got nothing going on. And I was really afraid of being uh, a letdown from kind of day one. To your parents? Uh, To myself even too, like my parents plus myself. And uh, I think that's kind of where I I have the drive and the the work ethic is like my just ability to just push myself and, and pretty much run myself to the ground. But, you know, I'm very afraid I of being enable of being enough you know it's mm. like but then there is this 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 that weird complex is like is that a blessing or a curse yeah i mean well if you always felt enough then you wouldn't need to do the things exactly but maybe you'd want to do the things anyway you know without the fear you don't necessarily need the fear to experience the abundance that working uh really hard and and 
focusing might give you. Yeah. I yeah. I just feel I don't know if I would know that another option. You know, it's like mm -hmm. I am who I am, right? So, and being able to just like understand like this is me. I can't really change me, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna understand my flaws. I'll understand things that I'm great at, and I'll excel at the things that I'm great at, and then just cogniz be cognizant of like when things come up. I know that this is my flaw, so like be way more vocal and communicate with other people about it and be like, this is an issue that I have, that I will have, guaranteed. So just be cognizant, like, this is where I'm sensitive in. And this is like, you know, it's it's helped it's helped me communicate with my mom. It's helped me communicate with my dad. Like, what do you think it was that changed your approach in life from being fearful, you know, and, and being afraid of what if I'm not enough to the approach that you have now, which seems a little bit more like you're living from that place of abundance, you know? I've already experienced so much. Everything else is just kind of like the cherry on top. I just like notice myself just being unhappy. And at that point, it's like, what am I doing? I'm in this position to make music. Let's just make music and have fun and do only the shit that I love. And that's where I was at, where I was like, I don't want to tour anymore. Let's just make a hundred songs. Mm -hmm. Make a hundred songs, choose the best, put them out and love them. And that's just one aspect of how that concept kind of works, where I've noticed myself being unhappy. What makes me happy? Being with my parents, move home. What else makes me happy? I don't know, being around friends, doing doing stupid shit, mm -hmm. saying stupid shit. And uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> this, you know, it's like, this is great. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a great experience. Yeah, you were telling me uh, a couple weeks ago after we learned the choreography for Submissive and Breedable, we went out to dinner and you were telling me about how you have this grand dream for the way that your life might unfold within the next few years with the goal of working hard, working hard, working hard. Boom, at some point now you can relax and you can make music just kind of casually or just, just like have a moment to experience life for what it is without focusing on productivity. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's where you want to go? Because at the same time, you're like, if I get there, though, I'll probably be bored and want to do more. We have to keep moving. We have to keep doing things. Uh, but I don't know where the cutoff point is where I'm going to be like, I am content. Right. I have no idea what that will be. But... I know for a fact I have been really feeling I want to buy groceries. And I want to <laughs> buy groceries and make a home-cooked meal at my own humble abode. Now that you know how much groceries cost and now, and I now know. that you've taste-tested more Armenian food, you're trying to get back in it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But at some point, it might get boring. I don't know. It hasn't yet. I just don't know where, where that cutoff point is. I don't know if I will ever be content. So the real reason I brought you on here today, Mr. Bibinos? Bibinos? What is it? <sighs> Bibinos? Is it Bibinos? Dude, why does everyone... To, uh, freestyle. Oh. So you're gonna freestyle for us real quick. No, I'm good, You're man. gonna freestyle. I'm not doing that. Anything about that. Just a, just a quick little freestyle. I'm, I'm good. I know we talked about how we I wouldn't ask you to do I'm that. I'm doing it. But, um... Nope. I think the internet really wants a quick little freestyle. Nope. For Mr. Bibinos. Is it? He literally just left. The last paper I ever had to write, I didn't write it. Paid someone to write it for me. Chat GPT. No, I wish that was a thing because I wouldn't have had to pay the guy to write it for me. Could have saved $12. 500. So <laughs> it was 32 pages. <laughs> Dude, some guy in my high school used to pay me to do his homework for him. Really? Yeah. That's fire. You made I get it. paid $20 a packet. Wow. But I, I, he was getting D's on all the homework I did for him, but he was like, better than what I would have done. And it was so funny because he'd be like, here's the notes the teacher gave me. And I was like, yeah, I'm not implementing any of those. I'm just going to keep, <laughs> just keep churning it out, bro. $20 a packet. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how I got rich. How about you? Same thing. 